In the depths of the sky wanders light Silent in its journey through the endless night Welcome to Comet Chasing, where we chronicle the fuzzy wanderers of our solar system with a focus on seeing them for yourself. Sometimes the- Hold up, hold up. We've got some breaking news. What you got, Les? A new comet has been discovered in swan images that had gone unnoticed until now. We don't know everything about this comet just yet, but the picture is starting to emerge. It is currently known unofficially as Swan 25F but we expect an official designation soon, likely C2025F2, SWAN. It looks like this comet will be easily visible in binoculars later this month. It should be noted, however, that it might have been missed before now because it is intrinsically faint. We may only be seeing it due to the start of a disruptive event. As a result, it may not survive being close to the sun for long. A call went out to the Comet Observing Community by Michael Mattiazzo on April 1st, who noted that there was a pretty obvious comet visible in Swan Comet tracker maps. For those wondering, Swan, Solar Wind Anisotropies, is an instrument on the SOHO spacecraft that maps hydrogen in the interplanetary medium by detecting Lyman Alpha emissions. It helps study the solar wind's interaction with interstellar hydrogen and tracks comets by imaging their hydrogen comas. Anyhow, it took a while because the initial positions weren't accurate enough for ground-based observers to find the comet, but some detective work eventually led to confirmation and even a good preliminary orbit, which isn't official just yet. By the morning of April 4th, this comet was being reported at magnitude 9.5, with a diameter of 2 to 3 arc minutes, and it had been spotted in large binoculars. So here is what we can say at the moment. Closest approach to the Sun is on May 1st at a distance of about 0.3 astronomical units. That's close, but not super close. It is currently predicted to reach maximum brightness of magnitude 4.8 in early May. The best visibility from the northern hemisphere near maximum brightness is predicted to be in late April, when it will be approximately magnitude 4.8. At that time it will be in Taurus very low in the northwestern sky during evening twilight and should be easy in the 7x50 binoculars. The best visibility in the southern hemisphere is very similar, except delayed until early May. That said, it's worth noting that the currently understood absolute magnitude of this comet, 9.4, is fainter than the classical Bortle survival limit of 8.8. .8. It's also worth considering that it may have already started to break up, the bottom line, assuming nothing changes, is that for observers in the Northern Hemisphere, we have a telescope or large binocular comet currently visible in the morning twilight. It will likely brighten as the month progresses, becoming perceptible in 7x50 binoculars on the morning of April 14th, and should become easily visible starting around the evening of April 26th and into early May. The visibility to Southern Hemisphere observers is not quite as good, it will be perceptible in 7 by 50 binoculars starting in the evening of May 3rd. Look for an update in next month's video for the visibility in May. Greg will be updating the Comet Chasing website regularly. That's really cool, Les. Unexpected news is always exciting. But we do have other comets, so let's get back to those. As I was saying, bright comets are rare, so a normal month of comet chasing involves tracking down several faint comets in the telescope. Sometimes these comets are bright enough to be seen in binoculars, which is a treat. Only rarely does a comet become bright enough to be seen by the unaided eye, and even then they can be difficult to spot because they're near the sun and must be observed in bright twilight. The twilight observations have an advantage that's rarely mentioned. When a comet can be seen in bright twilight, the twilight overwhelms the light pollution, so there's no real advantage to a dark sky sight. This means people can enjoy a twilight comet from their own backyard, even in a city. Another rarity is when a comet brightens dramatically in an outburst of activity. This can come out of the blue, like it did with 17P Holmes in 2007 and 12P in August of 2023. 17P went from a tiny fuzzy star only dimly seen in long exposure images to a bright spot in the sky surrounded by a luminous cloud that could be easily seen with the naked eye. It unexpectedly brightened by a million times. Imagine if that happened tomorrow. 
you'd want to see it for yourself. But the reality is that no matter how bright they are, or how much attention they get, comets are seldom truly spectacular to the eye, showing no color and few details. That majestic tail in a photograph is usually no more than a featureless faint streak of light to the eye. But that's how visual astronomy is. Knowing what you are looking at, what its story is, and knowing that most people will only see it in photos can make a colorless fuzzy blob exciting when you manage to spot it. Greg Crinklaw, the astronomer behind this channel, calls this seeing with your mind as well as your eye. As a result, spotting a faint smudge in your telescope can be just as cool as seeing a bright naked eye celebrity. It's all in how you look at it, so to speak. What we usually recommend to amateur astronomers with access to a telescope is to add one or more comets to their observing list the next time they find themselves out under a dark sky. Comets can be just as fun to chase down as, say, a faint planetary nebula, and they take you to new star fields you might never have visited otherwise. On a typical night, there are a half dozen comets visible from a dark site in an 8-inch telescope. It can be fun to keep track of which ones you have seen, and to revisit them as they slowly glide from one star field to another over the weeks, months, or even years. Some comets brighten as they approach the sun, then fade, only to return to do it all over again years later. Not only can you observe these again and again, but many were observed long ago, creating a link between you and your telescope and that of the great observers of the past. These are the periodic comets, with the number and the P in their designation. Some, like Halley, take a lifetime to return. Others, like 2P Enki, return every few years. Barring another new discovery or an unexpected outburst, April is looking like a pretty sparse month for comet chasing. We only have a few comets to look at in any size telescope, but each one has a story, so if you get the chance, add one to your list the next time you go out. We'll start with C2023A3 Suchinshan Atlas, a comet that might sound familiar. That's because it put on a spectacular show last fall. It's now slowly making its way out of the inner solar system, never to be seen again, at least in our lifetimes. 2023A3 is a morning comet visible from all latitudes in a 6-inch, 15-centimeter, or larger telescope from a dark site. It is 12th magnitude and a tiny 35 arc seconds in diameter, appearing like a small diffuse fuzzball with a condensation toward the center. It will fade slowly, moving from Delphinus into Vulpecula. It's visible all month, high in the pre-dawn sky, although the moon will interfere a bit from the 10th through the 18th. 13P, Olbers, is another comet on its way off stage. You might recall it from last summer. It is another morning comet, and it's currently visible in a 12.5-inch, 32-centimeter telescope at magnitude 13.9. It, too, has a tiny 40-arc second coma, with a diffuse condensation at the center. It's fading slowly on its outbound journey from the sun. The next time it will pass our way will be in the spring of 2094. 13P is best seen from a dark site in the southern hemisphere, where it will be perceptible after midnight through April 10th, when the moon will interfere. After that, it will fade enough to be more difficult to spot in the scope. Better placed for those of us who don't regularly stay up until dawn is P2010 H2 Veils. It's a new arrival to our monthly march of comets. It's very faint, but comes with an interesting caveat. When it was discovered in 2010, it was in the middle of a very large outburst, and there is no reason that can't happen again. So, while you technically will need an 18-inch telescope to easily spot it, its recent perihelion in March means it has a heightened likelihood of having another outburst, which could make it visible in much smaller telescopes. So we urge you to have a look for it every time you get the chance. You might be the first one to spot the outburst. And how cool would that be? An experienced observer may be able to spot it in a 12.5 inch, 32 centimeter scope under good conditions and a dark sky. It will be observable from the southern hemisphere all month, except when the moon interferes from the 7th through the 14th in the northern hemisphere or the 9th through the 17th in the south. It will look like a star, but your eye will notice something wrong with it, especially as you increase the magnification. It will look like the other stars at first glance, but a bit soft or fuzzy. 
After you've learned to spot a few of these, they will start to jump out at you. If you aren't certain you've found the comet, even with your higher power eyepieces, then note its position among the nearby stars. Come back 30 to 60 minutes later, and if that was your comet, it will have moved a bit. This is the view in an 18-inch telescope at 65 times. The comet may appear more star-like to the eye than we show here, because in reality the light is concentrated toward the center. Note how the comet lines up with the two stars nearby, making a straight line. And here's the view 30 minutes later. P2010 H2 Veils has an orbital period of 7.5 years, and its most recent perihelion was on March 9th at a distance of 3.1 astronomical units from the Sun. The orbit of this comet is reminiscent of another comet we've been following here at Comet Chasing, the exceptional 29P. Comet 29P slash Schwassmann Vachmann and P2010 H2 Veils are both classified as centaurs, orbiting between Jupiter and Neptune with low inclination, nearly circular orbits. Each has displayed unexpected outbursts, 29P being particularly well known for frequent and sometimes dramatic activity, while P2010 H2 was discovered during such an event. These outbursts are thought to be driven by the same cryovolcanic processes or the exothermic crystallization of amorphous ice. We covered 29P in detail in last month's video, so I'll point you there for the history of this very special comet. This month it's faded a bit, and the expanding coma from recent outbursts makes it more difficult to spot, but I'm going to mention it anyhow, because much like 2010H2, it deserves attention in smaller instruments. A new outburst may come any day now. Well, that's it for the comets this month, at least for now. Happy comet chasing, everyone.